Hi guys, um, today we will continue the discussion of the application layer uh, networking solutions and I want to dive deeper into content delivery networks which are an important part of um, delivering application layer data in modern networks. Okay, so when we were introducing um, HTTP and caching or when I was introducing HTTP I said that some of the data um, delivered to a client or the client requests can be cached and then delivered more quickly to the client because uh, where's my pointer because the cache is closer to the client there's less of a network or there's lower latency or higher bandwidth between the client and the cache than um, when the client needs to fetch data all the way from the server and I mentioned to you that content distribution networks provide a network of distributed caches, caches that are close to users. And so even when your organization doesn't have a cache or um, even if it does, instead of going from the client to the server or from the cache to the server, uh, client, uh, content can be fetched from the client to, uh, to the client from the CDN or to the cache in your organization from the CDN. So basically what content distribution networks do is they bring the server effectively closer to the client. Okay, so let's look at some motivation behind CDNs. So let's say you're running a big global site such as CDN and you want to get clients to millions of users that request it. So the first option is to create a giant data center that has enough um, capacity and have bandwidth to serve all the users. So the pro of that solution is that it's simple, you only have one server or some centralized set of servers that effectively act as one server. The downside is that you have a single point of failure, your server can fail and then your network, your users become disconnected. Um, you do have a single point of congestion and there are limits to how much bandwidth you can deliver to any one location. Right? You can think of it as Okay, how much bandwidth can you get into your home? Well, that's limited by your, let's say, um, cable connection. How much data can you get into a data center? Well, you can get some pretty beefy fiber in, but then you still need routers in there and the router capacity is limited by the number of ports. We'll kind of see how that uh, works a little bit later on. But there are basically some physical limits into how much bandwidth you can get into one location at a reasonable price. It, you can get much more bandwidth um, from multiple locations, basically. Um, another problem is that a lot of your clients will be quite distant from your data center. So if your server is in America and you have clients in Europe or in Asia, um, they have to suffer a lot of latency by sending the traffic over um, uh, ocean cables. Okay, and then basically from the point of view of a server, you're sending multiple copies of the same content out on the same link. There is no multicast implemented in networks in the internet. We'll talk about multicast later on. And so for each client, you need to send a separate copy of the data. Um, this obviously creates a lot of load on your servers. So we need a solution that's a bit more scalable than this. And so this is where content delivery networks come in. And what content delivery networks are, are basically set of caches that are distributed throughout the internet. So here on the right, we have um, a graphic uh, of the internet we've used before, where you have tier one ISPs, then internet exchange points that connect regional ISPs, um, and then you have access ISPs that serve different clients. Okay. And then you can um, look at the different strategies for deploying the servers. Okay. So one strategy is called enter deep, which is to push the CDN servers into many access networks. So for example, we have our local access network here through charter, through cable. And so there probably is an Akamai server somewhere in their infrastructure that serves clients in Bozeman. Okay. Um, another idea is the bring home strategy, which allows you to have fewer servers that are much larger but at the regional level or level of a regional ISP, maybe an ISP like Blackfoot Communication that serves Montana, Idaho, um, Eastern Washington, etc. 
Okay, and so the idea there is that you would have fewer of these servers, but they have much more memory, right? These are not just a server, this is, you know, a beefier rack or a series of racks that hold a lot of data. And so the difference between those approaches is that while an Akamai server might be close to the users and have low latency, um, so it can serve content faster, a client in an Access ISP may not be able to find the content that they need on the server because the server just doesn't have the memory to store everything that clients in this local ISP need. On the other hand, when you have a, an, a uh, CDN server at a regional ISP with more memory, that client is more likely to find the data that they need here, okay? So that data doesn't need to be fetched from somewhere else or you know, from a server in another regional ISP, but the client suffers more latency getting data uh, from this server. So um, there are some performance trade-offs depending on um, kind of how much overlap there is between what clients request. If there's a lot of overlap, Akamai service will work quite well. If there's not so much overlap, um, basically clients uh, request different content than this regional ISP approach or bring home approach um, will work much better. Now, there's an alternative strategy based on peer-to-peer -peer, um, where you actually have caches deployed on user devices and they exchange data um, through some sort of a peer-to-peer -peer system, for example, BitTorrent, okay? That works okay if you're fetching data from a user that is within your original ISP, but if you have to go to another ISP to fetch the content, well, you can see that that data has to now, your request is to travel through another network back to this user. So this link isn't really here. This is a logical ring link, but your traffic might need to travel somewhere else just to even get here, okay? It's possible that it goes through tier one ISP, it's possible that it goes through this internet exchange point in a regional ISP. It's possible that it travels somewhere completely, um, a completely longer path. Uh, you can't really control it as a client. This is based on the peering relationships uh, between these providers. We'll talk about how this traffic is routing when we talk about the network layer. Okay, so these are the three different strategies. Now, one thing to remember is that um, Content distribution networks can only serve static content. Static content is content that is content that does not change. So for example, a picture on a website is not going to change. You're either fetching this picture or another picture, but as long as you're fetching this picture, that picture is going to be the same across the different requests. This enables that picture to be cached at a CDN server. On the other hand, when you're requesting dynamic content, um, dynamic content means that it's content that is generated by the server that is um, specific to each user. So for example, when you are looking up the state of your Facebook feed, um, that content of the feed or what's on the feed is going to be different for each user. And that part of the website, as opposed to the images, has to be fetched from, let's say, Facebook servers or you know, Google servers or whatever other service you're using that provides you with customized content. So, if I'm requesting, um, let's say, um, some dynamic Google page, what I can do is fetch the images in the page from Akamai, but for the dynamic part, I would still have to, my browser would still have to contact Google servers to get that content. And there's not much the Cydians can do to speed this up. Okay, so another question is how to select a replica server, right? So if we have multiple uh, Akamai servers, as in this case, you can connect to this one, you can connect to that one, right? Um, this is all kind of possible. The question is, if you're a client in this network, how do you know to contact this server to ask this server for content as opposed to the server over here? Okay. So this is solved by your local DNS, which puts a request to resolve a particular web address under which your content is stored. So, for example, my profile picture might be hosted at profile.akamai.facebookcdn.net. So, if you're clever, you can kind of parse this out to see that this is a uh, facebookcdn.net, so this is a Facebook domain, but this is actually provided by, by Akamai. 
Okay, so it requires a little research to figure this out, but this is the case or has been the case when I took this, um, um, when I created the slide uh, a few years ago. Okay, so by the way, Akamai still hosts stuff for Facebook. Akamai hosts stuff for everybody, so this might not have changed actually. Um, okay, so what happens is to fetch this image, my browser needs to issue a request to resolve Facebook.akamai. Uh, sorry, profile.ak.fbcdn.net. Okay, so that resolves to this canonical name, which then can resolve uh, to um, um, which is an alias for akamai.net, okay, which then can resolve to um, all these different IP addresses. Okay, so when I contact my um, local DNS server, the process of resolving the domain will give me some IP and that IP is going to be actually the IP of one of these servers as opposed to one of those servers. Okay? So basically the domain name service has some information about um, which is the server close to me. Okay? And that can be done basically by the local DNS server um, including its IP address in its request such that the authoritative server of Akamai can figure out, okay, this local DNS is in this network, which means that uh, I should give it IP addresses that are nearby to this particular local DNS, which hopefully is close to the user. Okay. So CDNs are um, quite ubiquitous. Um, if you for example, load cnn.com, you'll see that there are 34 DNS lookups, um, this many HTTP requests for all the different images, for all the different contents, this much data is being downloaded. And in fact, these many of these requests, or I would say, well, maybe the majority of them are served by CDNs. Um, and you can see that even 56% uh, of domains actually resolve to um, a CDN. So, CDN, even by the HTML of that page, isn't hosted on, um, isn't being delivered from, C from CNN servers, it's actually being delivered from, uh, it's being hosted and delivered by a content distribution network. Okay, so I mentioned this, this problem already, but how to uh, find a good CDN node that is nearby to the clients? Okay. So one approach could be to pick um, a CDN node that is geographically close to the local um, DNS. Okay. So I mentioned this already, this is basically uh, kind of the starting point, um, but you can also be more clever and try to pick a CDN with the shortest delay or the minimum number of hops to the client. Okay. So what is the difference between geographically close and network close? Well, it turns out that the networks are mostly laid out geographically, right? You do have uh, kind of the surface of the globe and you do have to put the network somehow on top of it. So basically we're mapping uh, this network, sort of we're spreading it out across, across the globe, right? And so there is some path from, let's say an access ISP to the regional ISP, which broadly, um, follows the geography, but that's not necessarily the case. And even though a server can be close, for example, this server is close to this server, the path between those ISPs can still be a long one because they're not actually connected directly. They're connected through some other router in some other network. Okay. So geographically close doesn't necessarily mean close in terms of the network. So close in terms of the network really means the smallest number of hops or really the lowest latency that you can that you can find, which is often related to the number of hops. Okay. Um, another approach is to use IP Anycast. We'll talk about it more when I talk, um, when I explain um, issues at the IP layer or at the network layer. And what this allows you to do is to basically connect to any server that has the same IP. Okay. So instead of saying that each node has a unique IP address, you can host your servers all with the same IP and let 
the network routing algorithms connect you to the closest node. Okay, so um, I sort of mentioned this already, but the client contacts the local DNS server, which then contacts the authority of the DNS server to actually get the IP of a nearby server. And that authoritative DNS server can basically look at the location of the local DNS and say, okay, this local DNS is probably close to the client, so I'm going to return to it the IP addresses of servers that I think are close to this local DNS, and so hopefully they'll be then close to the client. Okay, so the authoritative DNS looks at the IP of the local DNS, it translates that IP to a geographic location or a network location, and based on that, find servers that are nearby, and hopefully those are then close to the client. Now, a problem can happen when the local DNS is actually not close to the client at all. This can happen when you are setting your local DNS to be something like 8.8.8.8, which is Google's open DNS server. There are a few of those, but none of them is particularly close to every client, right? They're just in few locations. So those are automatically not close to the client in general, okay? It could also be in a cellular network that your local DNS is quite far. This has to do with how cellular networks still work. Um, this might change with 5G, but what happens in a cellular network is that your packet is actually forwarded to a cell phone tower and then internally and then somewhere it comes out of the cellular network to then connect to the internet. And that connection of that point of exit of your packets from the cellular network to the internet could be quite far from the actual client. Okay, so then um, the resulting CDN servers that you're going to get are going to be quite far from the client. So what can be done? Well, a few years ago, people started working on this problem and they came up with a solution called eDNS0 or extension to DNS0. And what this extension does is it includes basically the IP address of the client in the DNS request. So when you are sending a DNS request, this is um, kind of the packet format. We didn't go over it in detail. It doesn't terribly matter, but there is the space in the DNS packet for additional information. So the extension to the DNS protocol was the addition of this additional field, which is forwarded by the DNS servers. So basically DNS servers have been upgraded to support eDNS zero, and now they forward not just the original DNS packet, but also this extension information. And this extension information looks basically like this. It says eDNS version zero, that's your extension zero, and it includes the prefix of the client IP or all of the client IP, okay? So we didn't talk about IP addresses yet, but if you remember, they have this kind of four tuple of, of numbers, and so, these numbers, basically, you don't need to include all kind of four um, parts of it. You can include just the first two, and it turns out those are just the first 16 um, bytes. So you're just forwarding the beginning of the IP address. And this actually gives you quite a lot of information about where that IP is in the network. For example, which ISP this resides in. And it turns out to be good enough to identify the location of the user and so now the resolution of um, which servers the authoritative DNS should return to the LDNS isn't based on the LDNS location on the LDNS IP, but it is based on the client IP, which is passed to the LDNS and then passed to the authoritative DNS, allowing the authoritative DNS to make a decision based on client network location. And it turns out that this has quite a lot of, uh, this gives quite a lot of um, uh, improvement in performance in terms of end-to-end -end latency. So what this graph shows um, is, a, this is basically a very common way to show network performance. Um, and it's basically, is called a CDF graph. So the way to read those graphs, you'll see those again, is to first look at the x-axis, which in this case gives us the end-to-end -end latency percent difference. So how much faster in this measurement is 
um, how much lower the latency is to the CDN server in one case or another. So then we have the two um, DNS solutions, okay, or the latency to the content server based on the DNS resolution. Okay? And on the y-axis, we have the CDF or the percentage of nodes which experience lower performance than what is shown in these lines. Okay, so how to read this? So let's look at 50% of clients. 50% of clients okay, are going to have um, this much of the difference between um, the connection, uh, the latency that you get to the CDN server. Okay? So for the original Google DNS solution, you would have latency of um, almost 150. So 50% 50 of clients would have latency to the CDN server of less than 140 milliseconds. And the potential from deploying um, EDNS extension for 50% of clients, it would move that latency to something more like, I don't know, 65. Okay, so you can see that by deploying EDNS, you actually get to move um, or reduce the latency to a replica CDN server by this much for this many clients, or for this percentage of clients. Okay, um, here's another solution that was part of my research with one of my PhD students, which was a way to use multiple DNS servers to try to find the absolute best replica server. So what we've observed is that even with LDNS extensions being passed to the authoritative DNS servers, these servers still don't make a very good idea, still don't provide very good IP addresses to the client. Okay? So the authoritative DNS finds out the IP of the client. There is a separate mapping system implemented at the CDNs that, that tells the authoritative DNS that for this IP, probably the nearby IPs are such and such, and that's what the authoritative DNS returns to the client. Now, this mapping system between the client IP and the nearby uh, replica servers is not very good. And so by contacting different DNSs, you can actually get different answers as to what are the close CDN servers. And so what we can do is actually look at where those DNS, uh, where those CDN servers are and try to pick the closest one. So here's how this protocol works. So the client sends a DNS res uh, resolution request, let's say for facebook.com, to our DNS proxy, which is our solution. Okay? DNS proxy can then forward this DNS request to multiple DNS servers. Okay? And it gets responses from those DNS servers for the replica servers. Okay, which are the CDN servers. Now, what we can do is actually measure the latency to those CDN servers by opening a TCP connection. So opening TCP connection requires sending a SYN packet and getting a SYN ACK, which is part of the uh, connection establishment process. And we can see how long it takes to open a, um, a, a TCP connection to each of these servers, basically very quickly measuring the latency to these servers. Now, based on that, we can decide which of these servers is the closest one, or the DNS proxy decides that, and then returns the IP address of the closest servers. So instead of just doing resolution, we're doing resolution and then measurement, okay? And then the nice thing that happens is that even though we're doing this extra measurement, the benefit of contacting the or finding the closest CDN server still saves us time in terms of the time it takes to download a web page. So even though we take longer to provide the DNS response through this DNS proxy, by providing a better server, the client is actually able to save time when loading, when then sending multiple requests for content to this CDN server. And you can see that there are benefits to this approach. So, um, for example, you can kind of compare the warm and uh, cold cache approaches, which is basically, are we doing this resolution 
um, every time or are we using the uh, DNS proxy cache to do this resolution to basically um, reply right from the cache. And you can see that there are improvements um, to these different approaches in terms of web page load time for the different pages um, and in terms of um, Oop, it looks like I have the same graph twice. Um, I might need to fix this. Um, okay, so basically what happens if, oh, okay, so this is in terms of uh, milliseconds reduction time and this is in terms of percentage. So let's look at percentage, maybe that's a little easier. So um, if you are using the cold cache approach, which is basically um, um, doing the resolution of the fly, doing the measurement of the fly, on the fly, you are, we are able to send, to save almost 30% of time in terms of how long it takes to load a page. Whereas if you're using the warm cache, you're able to save closer to 40% uh, for Huffington Post. And then for different sites, um, these benefits are smaller, maybe based on the fact that they have less content or fewer DNS um, or fewer static images to load. Okay. And then instead of percentage, we can look at it in terms of reduction in page load time. So basically we're able to save um, with cold cache almost two and a half or just over two and a half seconds when loading HuffingtonPost.com uh, using cold cache and using warm cache um, almost 3.5 seconds. Now this is actually substantial. You may think that 2.5 or 3.5 second reduction is not substantial but it actually is when your page loads for six seconds, right? You can get, um, or I guess maybe a little bit more than six seconds because we're like close to 40%, but you can see it's quite a significant reduction and it actually matters a lot to users in terms of their satisfaction or when it comes to e-commerce side in terms of um, how much they actually buy from Amazon. So Amazon has this famous study where by making their website faster, they're actually able to produce uh, close more sales because people did not abandon the, the buying process as easily. All right, so that's a relatively fast overview of, of CDNs. Um, there's a lot more to it. I've done quite a bit of research on CDNs, so you can ask me kind of more, more questions. Um, that kind of CDN market and what's important has also changed significantly in the past couple of years. Um, CDNs tend to care uh, kind of solved the problem of content delivery to a large extent. Now they're looking at other issues such as speeding up uh, JavaScript on pages, for example, by removing JavaScript code that's actually not executed. Um, they are on the forefront of speeding up uh, web content delivery. Um, now they're also moving into speeding up how uh, mobile apps work because they increasingly act a lot more like web pages instead of caching all the information on the phone, they're actually end up downloading a lot of information. So um, CDNs are is still an active research today and it basically has to do not so much with speeding up web content, but in speeding up uh, how data is loaded from servers. All right, thank you guys.